excuse me a minute, but I talk with my hands, and when I do that, the mic would be up here, and you wouldn't be able to hear me, so... Uh, I can hear it. Um, how many people ever wondered why we actually get baptized as Christians? Anybody ever wonder why? Because we meet so many people that are out there that are believers that, that, that just aren't. They just aren't. And you wonder, you know, you go from one church to another church to one denomination to another denomination. And basically, everybody's got a little different twist on water baptism. And um, usually when we get into the basics of, of talking about water baptism, then they talk about method. Well, are you to be sprinkled? Or are you to be dipped? And uh, I, I remember, um, I, I remember one time I used to uh, relate to a black church when I was a younger Christian in Michigan, and um, they would they would baptize people forward. They didn't think it was right to baptize people backwards, but uh, they would baptize them forward until they talked in tongues. <laughs> Now, I'm sure that if I was dunked underwater 37 times, I'd be doing something to... Uh... But then there's the method. We always talk about the method. We talk about, well, what's right? What's, um, what's you know, because I've been in both camps, all right? I know where I started, and I know where the word of the Lord has taken me to. But, um, and, and I've had the same arguments that everybody else had, but after a while, when the Lord talks to you, you know, he, he begins to bring you into what he's looking for. And so we, if you're going to start a teaching on water baptism, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take you to Matthew 28. And... 18 and 19 and the, the words of Jesus. Because Jesus said, uh, go ye into all the world um, baptizing. And he, he was talking about nations. I, I'm not going to quote it. I'm not going to go there. He wasn't talking about individuals. He's talking about nations. And the word baptize, um, the minute I say baptize, the first thing that goes into your mind is water. That's, that's the first thing. That's what we think. If, if I say baptize, I say, whoa, that's water. Well, the word really doesn't mean that. What the mer word means is to be mer immersed or to be covered over with. That's what the word is. That's why is it that we people who believe in the Pentecostal experience talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is really a... Uh, kind of a, uh, what's the word I want to say? Um, it, it's kind of different because we believe that we're being baptized in the Holy Ghost, but at the same time, 
we're really not talking about being covered over with the Holy Ghost. We're talking about the Holy Ghost coming up and out of you and you speaking in tongues. So basically, we, we, have, we have these pictures that's, that's in the Word. And Jesus said, go, baptize, go and baptize them, um, teaching them, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Well, basically, I'm, you know, that was my point. That's where I used to stand for 20 years, or I grew up there. And then I began to understand as God began to reveal to me that Father is not a name. I have a given name. My, my, my given name is, is Dale. But to my children, I'm father, I'm dad. My grandchildren, I'm pops or whatever else they want to call me. Um, but the, the issue is, uh, father is really my position. It's, it's my title, it's not my name. It's my function. Okay? Um, immersing them in the name of the Father, and we can take it this way, in the name of the Son. Well, Son's not a name either. Son is a function. That's a position. You know, I'm the son of my Father, okay? But my children are the son of, my children are sons of me, or daughter, my daughter, my lovely one. And, and then you understand that, so the son is not a name, it's a position, it's a function. And so then it says, in the name of the Holy Ghost. So we understand that Holy Ghost is not a name, it's a position, it's a function. It points out an aspect of God. But if we go into a deep study of the Word of God, we will find out that his name is, in the Hebrew, is Yah. Yah. God's name is Yah. That's Hebrew. But we had no, in, uh, there are some who translate it, put the, the vowels in it, and they come up with the, the thing called Yahweh. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, we, we use the principle Jehovah in, in, in reading the King James Bible. We have Jehovah. But as you look into the aspect about Jehovah, usually the Hebrew word that's being used there is Adonai. How we transfer Adonai to Jehovah, I really don't understand how that ever happened, but it, but it happens. But then we come over into the New Testament, and the New Testament is in Greek. And the name of God that we find pictured in the New Covenant is Isus in the Greek, or Jesus. The meaning of the name means Yah saves. Is that all right? Am I over your head? Is I... Have I gone over your head? The meaning of God's name, Jesus is, Yah, God, saves. And I don't have time to go into the whole dimension of the whole thing, um, explain it, because you can be, we could be here for the next 300 years and we never could fully explain God. Because he's far beyond human complete human expression. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time except in the face of Jesus Christ. And I've, I've used this over and over again. My friend, my now deceased friend Kelly Varner wrote in his book back there whose right it is, he started out with the Christmas story. And when the angels looked down out of heaven into that manger, and there was that eight-pound bundle of love, they said, oh, my God, there's God. But the angel, when, she came, when he came to Mary, said, 
You, you name him Jesus. He said to Joseph, you name him Jesus. You call him Yah saves or Yah delivers. And so when we come to this aspect, you say, what's this all got to do with water baptism? Because Jesus said, go baptize, go immerse nations, go immerse them. And I don't have time to go into the whole thing. But he said, you go immerse them in the name of the Father, Yah, in the name of the Son, Yah saves, and the name of the Holy Ghost, which is the expression of God, because God is spirit. You all with me so far? Am I over anybody's head? Okay. So when we bring it over into the New Testament, if you turn to Acts chapter 2, let me see, I want to start maybe, I don't know. You know, Peter preached a long time in chapter 2. You all know the story. Most of the church folks, we all know the story. God told the, uh, told the disciples, he said, I want you guys to go. Uh, uh, and he said, you go in this room and you wait. All they had to wait was 10 days. That was, that was the period. From the time of his resurrection, Jesus walked on the earth in resurrection life for 40 days. And then he was caught up. And he'd already told him, he said, um, I'm going to come again. And he did. Ten days later, he showed up in that upper room. But not only did he show up in the upper room, because Peter stood up that day and he said, after they had experienced this marvelous expression of the Holy Ghost coming in their lives, or God, or Yah coming into their lives, they've expressed this real enlightenment, and it said that there was like tongues of fire on them, and, and, they, and, and there was this great thing, and they all went up. And I really like this because it said they went out and they began to preach, you know. It's the only time I think in the world that preachers all stood up together and said the same thing. Anyway, so Peter stood up and he began to express or try to tell the people that were around there. you got to understand it was the time of Pentecost. It was 50 days after resurrection, Passover, and they were people from every a gathering where the Jews or the Israelite people had been gathered because the Lord had commanded them three times a year, you come to Jerusalem to worship. So here they were, and if you count down through there, there were 19 different dialects, 19 different languages. And all of a sudden, out comes all these 120 preachers that had had this experience and they began to speak of the glory of God. And they began to speak of the mighty of God. And the people said, how is it? Some said, oh, they're drunk. Nine o'clock in the morning, they're drunk. And some said, oh, they, th this is that. And, you know, it's, it's like any time you go to church. If you don't understand, somebody says it's this, somebody says it's that, somebody says it's another thing. It all depends on how you hear it. But Peter said, this is that, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I've been in a lot of churches that are still waiting for Joel's promise to come to pass someday down in the future. But Peter said, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So let me see if I can find that verse here about, oh, let's start about there, okay? Let's start in verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and he, his sepulcher is with us until this day. And therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God, or Yah, had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, or somewhere in his genealogy, the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to set on his throne. 
Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is his function or his ministry. Jesus was his name and is his name. But his function and his ministry is Christ. Okay? He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in, the, in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus, this Jesus, hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being at the right hand, the word right hand does not mean that in heaven there are three chairs. And God's in the middle chair, and Jesus is in the right chair, and the Holy Ghost is in the left chair. Doesn't mean that. In the right hand means in the full authority of God. The right hand speaks of all of God's power. Jesus had already told him that back in Matthew 28. He said, all power, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. I got a question for you. Who's in charge? Who? Who's in charge? He said, all authority, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, he either told the truth or he's lying. For uh, Let me see. Verse, therefore, being at the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. In other words, the Holy Ghost was, was under the authority of Jesus to send to earth. And so he sent him. Okay? For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Guess what? Does anybody know what God's doing in this hour? He's doing what? He's making all his enemies his footstool. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word Lord in the Greek is the word kyrios. It means owner, master, head, boss man, I'm in charge. And Christ means the anointing or the anointed one. Okay? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should he do? Or not like us Christians, we go about what should we believe? That's the first, I don't know what to believe. I'm so confused. I don't know what to believe. They listened to the messenger and they said it pricked our hearts. What do we have to do? It's not a matter of what do we believe. It's what do we have to do? He'd already told him, you're murderers. You just killed the Lord of glory. And they said, what should we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Now, everybody gets this idea about, about repentance, you know. I, I find that a lot of people repent, but they only repent because they get caught. Oh, you mess up and then you repent, right? I, oh, I'm not doing that again. You know, that's not what he's talking about here. Repentance means, the, re, the real word, the word in the Greek means it's metanoia, and it means through the mind. It means to continually turn the mind exactly 180 degrees. Now, you've got to understand, he was talking to the most religious people on the planet at this time. He was not out there in the world. He was talking to the church folks. And he said to them, you've got to repent. 
you got to stop thinking the way you think. You got to change your mind. Well, God, I'm I'm 60 years old. I'm 50 years old. I'm 15 years old. I'm 30 years old, and and I'm only doing what my mama told me. But the Bible also says it's the traditions of men that make the word of God of no effect. Could it be possible that mama was wrong? Because she was taught wrong. So Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you. He did not say some of you. Um, you know, I, I, I've gone through this. You know, I remember the first time I brought this subject up to my pastor when we were in this, this is so long ago, it's hard to remember. It was back in the early 60s. And I brought this up to my pastor, and he said, he handed me the, um, the, the church manual, the official manual, and he said, well, that doesn't mean what it says. Here, you got to read this. And I said, uh, wait a minute. Show me that in the Bible. That's all I wanted to see was in the Bible. Show me in the Bible. He said, repent and be baptized, not some of you, but every one of you. So that answers my question. Why do we baptize Christians? Because G Peter said, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that every one of us needed to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Every one of us must repent and be baptized, every one of us, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or the putting away of sins. Remission is different than forgiveness. And I haven't got time to go into Greek. There's two words in the Greek. One, one's a thesis and the other one's a feme. One means to remit. It means to, to, to put away. But, but let's, let's just say tonight, tonight we're going to baptize um, uh, Shemus and, and, and Gabby. And, and so let's just say that um, I, I, um, I had a, a, a car. And Seamus wanted to buy that car from me. And so I, I tell Seamus, give me a thousand bucks and you can have the car. Okay? So he, he says to me, well, I really don't have the money right now. I, I just don't have the money right now, but I'll pay you in a month. Okay? But I, being the nice guy I am, I'm, I, I tell him, well, you can take the car, Seamus. But he still owes me the thousand bucks. Yep. Now, at the end of 30 days, I can do two things. I can forgive him the debt, and the car's him, his. But he's never remitted to me the thousand bucks. He's never given me what is due me. And God forgives us, but he never gives a, we never give back to him what's due him. God doesn't forgive us just so we can be ourselves. God forgives us so that we give back to him our life. That's what God's after. He's not, he's, he's not just after forgiving you and let you do your thing. He's after you remitting your life back to him. So this is what Peter's saying here. He's saying, repent every one of you and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, I don't... I don't have time to go into this. But the, but the real purpose of water baptism has to do with what 
If you were ever brought up Catholic, you would know this statement, the original sin. Now, um, I, I don't want to make fun of it, any of the Catholic folks or anything. I, I love my Catholic brethren. But they make mistakes, just like we all make mistakes. And they're, they're wrong in areas, just like we're always wrong in areas. So, so the, the issue is, the original sin has got to be taken care of. We got to deal with it. Now I know how, I know what they do in practice. I know what they do, but I also know what the Bible says. And so we are dealing here with adults. We're dealing with people who have come to Christ, and we're going to baptize them. But there's a purpose. It's because in baptism, in the name of Jesus Christ. It's when the old man, the original man, the guy you were born, when that original man is, he's already been forgiven. God's already forgiven him. Calvary took care of that. Calvary and the blood took care of the forgiveness. But here's the old man. He's still alive. He's still hanging on your back. He's still following you around. And in, in most of the time, most people don't realize they're carrying this old dead man around all the time. But water baptism in the Bible brings us to a position where we bury the old man in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm getting late and I don't want to go any further. But the issue is, if I went on, I would take you over to Romans 6, and I would be spending a bit of time over there telling you that, no, you're not, there's so many of us. We're baptized into, into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into his death. What, would it, what did his death do? His death took care of Adam. The Bible says that Jesus was the last Adam. Now, how many's left after that if he was the last? He was the last Adam, but he is the new man. And so when we get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in water, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and the putting away of the old man, we are burying the old person and all his behavior. Yes, sir. And when they come up out of the water, according to Paul's writing in Romans 6, you rise to newness of life. King James Bible says newness of life. But if you really look at some of the other translations and you, and you look at the original Greek, it says you arise to a new life. Paul said it this way when he wrote to the Corinthians in the second letter in 517. He said, if any man be in Christ, how did you get in? You got baptized in. Yes, you did. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's not the old guy. That guy is buried. That guy is put down under the water. He's been completely identified with Jesus' death on the cross, which was when he killed Adam. Oh, I shouldn't have said it that way. But you come completely identified with that, and your old man is buried, and when you come up, you come up in the Christ. Now, I told the kids when I took them in the back room, that does not mean that you can just float along and go along as just any old way. You're still going to have to say no. You're still going to have to say no to sin. You're still going to have to say no to the world. You're still going to have to say yes to God. Are, are we okay? Yes, sir. Did I get it across? Yes. If anybody's got any questions, see me afterwards. But, but I got a couple of things to do. First thing I got to do is I got to get you guys worshiping the Lord. And uh, 
we got to get ready, and we're going to baptize a couple of young people. We're going to take them out of Adam, put them in Christ. Amen. Praise God. Come on, Danny.